this episode of The Hub. Recently, the permanent mission of China and permanent mission of the Russian Federation to the United Nations Geneva co-hosted an online conference. The topic, democracy and human rights. Diplomats and scholars from the developing world challenge the monopoly of Western narratives and discourse on human rights. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Kuhn, commentator on international politics and also chairman of the Kuhn Foundation. Dr. Kuhn, please go ahead. My short presentation today focuses on what China calls its whole process people's democracy, a mysterious phrase to Westerners who assume that China's political system, which has neither multiple parties nor general elections, can be in no way democratic. Yet, when President Xi Jinping explains China's great rejuvenation, China's second centenary goal of becoming a fully modernized socialist nation by the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China in 2049, he uses six aspirational adjectives, the third of which is democratic. He calls democracy a shared value of humanity and a key tenet upheld by the party and the Chinese people to be used, he says, to solve the problems that the people want to solve. The party's call is to expand the orderly political participation of the people, to strengthen the protection of human rights and the rule of law, and to ensure that the people enjoy extensive rights and freedoms in accordance with the law. Democracy in the party-led system in China involves absor absorbing public opinion via feedback mechanisms, such as polling to discern what people think, for example, about proposed new policies, a process that the party calls pooling people's wisdom. Another example is when officials are nominated to new positions, there is a period of time for candid private feedback from colleagues and subordinates, as well as from superiors. So even though there are no elections in the Western sense, there is a good deal of engagement with different constituencies. In enhancing whole process people's democracy, President Xi calls for upholding and improving the People's Congress system, stressing properly and effectively exercising their power of oversight. Moreover, the work reports of party leadership at party congresses every five years and of the government at the National People's Congress every year reflect a great deal of input and suggestions from all relevant officials, experts, and, cons and constituencies, whether in the party or not. The documents uh, circulate iteratively many times during the six to eight months or more of the drafting process. I like to stress the increasing role of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference in the development of deliberative and consultative democracy. Because even though the CPPCC has no formal legal power, it has the growing social powers of expertise, influence, and public pressure. I've seen officials and ministers who maybe 20 years ago would have ignored the advice from experts in the CPPC today take it very seriously because they're worried about the social pressure if they ignore it. And that's a very good sign for China's developing uh, deliberative democracy. For those foreigners who marvel how China contained COVID-19 with so few cases and deaths compared to other countries, I point out that the common root of China winning the war to contain the novel coronavirus and China winning the war to eradicate extreme poverty is the CPCs, the party's leadership and organizational capacity. This remarkable parallelism is a probative insight into, the, into China's party-led governance system. I've been coming to China for more than 30 years. I've traveled across China, visiting well more than 100 cities with my long-term partner, Adam Ju, for research and interviews, books and essays, television and documentaries. Yet, as much as I thought I knew China, I did not appreciate all that is required for poverty alleviation until I personally visited poor regions, especially remote mountain villages, and spoke with poor villagers. 
It was in 2013 that President Xi first proposed the concept of targeted or precision poverty alleviation. The, the realization was that even though China's GDP and GDP per capita would continue to increase, there would be about 100 million people who would never get the benefit of that because they were in remote mountain villages or uh, were minorities and didn't speak a language, various reasons and firm. And so therefore this targeted approach was focused on these 100 million people. Targeted means standardized procedures and individualized programs to bring each poor family out of poverty. Five levels of local party secretaries coordinate their roles. I've followed all of them, provincial, municipal, county, township, and village. And then third party evaluation teams are sent in so that evaluations are conducted regularly and randomly to ensure accuracy and, and honesty. For example, the third party evaluation teams sometimes don't decide which uh, township or village they're going to till that morning so that there can be no uh, planning behind the scenes and information sent. So it's very sophisticated approach to checks and balances. I was startled to discover that every poor family, every poor family in China has its own file. That's tens of millions of poor families during this process, each with its own customized plan, each checked monthly by a local cadre and digitized for central compilation and analysis. Equally startling to me is that local officials are, were dispatched to impoverished villages to manage poverty alleviation for two years, up to two years, a remarkable uh, a contribution that local cadres, sometimes in their late 20s or early 30s, would be away from their families. They could go back and visit, but basically they're away for these two years. After China eliminated all extreme poverty by the end of 2020, relative poverty obviously was still extant. And thus, and thus President Xi set a broader, longer term goal and did it immediately called common prosperity, which is now uh, one of the major drivers of China's uh, uh, development uh, toward the year uh, 2049 and 2050. So with all of this, my friends in China asked me, why does the world so misunderstand the party and the party system? The problem I respond, I argue, is partly semantics, because the English word party connotes in democratic political systems, a political party that competes in free and open multi-party elections, such that when a ruling party does not compete in free and open multi-party elections, that system, ipso facto, is deemed not democratic. This portrait mispaints the Chinese system, which is the only system I'm commenting on now, it's the one I know, because the Chinese system is founded on a different principle, where the party is the ruling organization, not a competing political party. It is a dedicated elite from all sex sectors of society, consisting of roughly or slightly less than 7% of the population, but tasked to represent 100% of the population. That doesn't mean it's done perfectly, but that's the ideal. Thus, the party in China, as the ruling organization, is not the equivalent of a ruling political party in Western systems, where political parties represent only a certain sector of voters and are time bound by election cycles. For this reason, the Chinese party, the CPC, has, in my opinion, a higher and broader obligation to enhance the living standards and personal well-being of all Chinese citizens. This includes the usual list of reforms, rule of law, transparency in government, public participation in governance, increasing democracy, as we've said, and various freedoms, including that of expression and human rights. These are real challenges. All political systems, all political parties have trade-offs. And while achieving national objectives is indeed an advantage of China's party-led system, it is not the only criterion for evaluating systems. This is why continuing reform and opening up and system improvement are needed. Looking ahead in China, 
given that democracy is the aspirational goal, one of the six adjectives, as I've said, the others being prosperous, strong, democratic, um, uh, um, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful, those are the six, uh, but democracy is right there as number three. So given that aspirational goal, what kinds of system improvements need be made? These are questions that must be asked. What are the boundaries for improvements? What's the optimal balance over time between development as development occurs to achieve common prosperity, as it said in China, and freedom of expression? And will that balance change over time? Thank you. Sheshe, spasiba. Our next speaker is Professor Marcos Piles, Associate Professor of UNESP, Sao Paulo State University. Sir, please go ahead. Bom dia, boa tarde. É um prazer. Good morning, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to have with you a historical debate on the issue of human rights and democracy, because um, human rights and democracy are values shared by humankind. Now, the enjoyment of those rights is a shared goal of everyone because everyone aspires to a political model that guarantee their right to a decent life, work, health, housing, and security. And we understand that those rights were acquired through the different revolutions for example, the French Revolution, amongst others, in the 19th and 20th centuries, that ensured the equality before the law, which are linked to eliminating slavery, feudalism, and forced labor. That's what happened in Brazil in 1888 with the end of slavery, in Russia in 1917, and also in China in 1949. It's important to highlight that there is no single model or path like England or the US tried to impose on other peoples in order to achieve these goals associated to democracy and human rights. Such assumptions and actions reveal an arrogance to think that a Western political and economic model is universal and the only one to, that can lead individuals to the full um, achievements of their being. We need to understand how the Western was created. Well, it's based on Judeo-Christian roots, and those traditions are individualists per se, because based on the Judeo and Christian outlook, the uh, salvation of the soul is an individual task. It doesn't matter if my family is not well. What matters is my condition, my well-being. Therefore, those individual values uh, tend to be also universal values. So added to this, we have the empiricist theory from the 18th century that established what we call natural laws, such as the right to life, individual freedom, and above all, private property. The defense of such values justified the English imperialism in the 19th century, that to mask the exploitation and plundering of non-European peoples engaged in a, an evangelizing and civilizing mission. And with the rise of the US in the 20th century, such values started to include also the um, uphold of human rights justifying military interventions and sponsored coup d'etats in several countries worldwide, especially in Latin America. In the meantime, the United States government was, a, was able to prove that the idea of uh, building those type of liberal democracies are wrong as they maintained a billion dollar war in Afghanistan and they had to withdraw when it was impossible to impose a model that was rejected by the majority of the Afghan population. And they also sacrificed themselves to expel the invaders. And Joe Biden said, as we turn the page on the foreign policy that has guided our nation the last two decades, we've got to learn from our mistakes. And for me, there are two that are paramount. First, we must set missions with clear and achievable goals not those we will never achieve. 
And secondly, we need to keep clearly focused on the fundamental national security interests of the US. And that decision from um, Afghanistan is not only about the Afghanistan, it's about putting an end to an era of major military operations to remake other countries. So what is valid for Afghanistan, in my opinion, is also used for Cuba, Syria, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, amongst other countries in which the US government tries to impose its will. And I would like to highlight, there is no single path that the people of the world can take to achieve the goal of common good. There are pillars on which the society is underpinned, such as history, religion, and culture, as our colleague from the Russian Federation stated. Therefore, the simple reproduction of foreign models does not guarantee effective adjustment in traditional structures. So we can have a government, but history goes on. Therefore, we can mention countries where we have systems of electoral competition like a Western democracy. However, in those same countries, there are social practices in which a fate of a person is um, determined by um, the color of their skin or the case where they're born. We cannot talk about democracy without talking about the social origin um, that people can achieve through a society. Even in countries where those human rights are fully guaranteed, how does this competition for power take place? So are the rules made to ensure equality or to favor particular groups, especially those that are um, wealthier? So how does mass communication work? And more, more importantly, how those um, algorithm management companies work. Another problem focused on the U US is that they also bring um, distortions to representation. They are now um, going through a process of um, redistribution of districts, which is a way of diluting um, representation of minorities. If we take a look at the electoral maps, in the US states, it seems absurd to understand how those districts are uh, designed. The main issue is, unless we guarantee the effective participation of ordinary people in the, discuss in the discussions of the country's main problems with um, neighborhood committees, um, this system will result in abysmal leaders, showmen, weird leaders that disseminate lies and electoral manipulation, as we have seen in the Western. And unfortunately, that's the case of Brazil. So to conclude, each country has to build a model that provides for prosperity, security, and stability to all its citizens. There is a universal aspiration for democracy and fairness, but no universal political model fits all realities. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Our next speaker is permanent representative of Lebanon, His Excellency, Mr. Salim Badura. The international community, uh, could she uh, thrive and function with a diversity of values or does she need some kind of common uh, principles, understandings, etc., etc.? Uh, uh, one additional element is the question about human rights. Uh, is there a hierarchy between human rights? Are some human rights more important than others? What is the bedrock of human rights, etc.? All these questions were part of uh, human uh, intellectual endeavors, philosophical debates, uh, but now they have jumped and they have become part of 
and parcel of politics, of international politics, of uh, international strategic competition, uh, etc. And we feel it here in, in Geneva because this competition uh, around these uh, questions and uh, thematics is stymieing our, our work when we try to tackle the global challenges that concerns us all. So I think the, the, it's, it's the reason for this workshop. So my question to the panelists is uh, how do they envisage the future? Do they think that this question, we will be more and more in the future mired in, in these questions and with controversies, endless uh, in fighting and debates about them, or uh, will be tending more and more to ironing out the difference on these uh, questions. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Ambassador from Nigeria, His Excellency Mr. Richards Adahola. Please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Well, the question I would love to raise and to our panelists, having accepted and in sync with the UN model that there are no monoliths when we come to the discourse on democracy and human rights. The two questions are these, and uh, they actually uh, are in line with uh, uh, the last speaker, the SNC, the ambassador of uh, Lebanon. Uh, the first one I would uh, want to raise is uh, what exactly are those common goals as we have in line with the, the theme? And at what point do we or should we begin to apply those diversified approaches? I thank you. Those are the two. Thank you. Obviously, and apparently we have more questions than we have um, time to get to all of them, but we'll try our best to get to as many questions uh, as we can. Um, I see uh, Dr. Robert Kuhn here. Maybe you can give a shot at uh, answering some of the questions that have been raised. Sure, I'd be very happy to, uh, to do it. Uh, I, I think the challenge, as I said in my talk, is for us to define a set of parameters that um, can be utilized um, and expanded by this group that can define a broader concept of, of democracy. Um, I think there, there has, there can be an equal tendency of one side to homogenize the other side. Um, I sort of sit at both, uh, both places, being an American and appreciating our system of, of values and, uh, and openness, um, and yet understanding China in its developmental history, et cetera. Um, and so I, 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 I don't want us to get caught in, in, a, uh, in a bifurcation that is, uh, that is artificially simplistic, um, but to come together to articulate what democracy means in its broader sense. And one way to do that is to project forward uh, into the future what would it look like in your individual country, given your individual cultures? Uh, if, uh, if you begin to achieve that, what would the relationship between the, the, the uh, collective and the individual be at a future time? Um, rather than looking at the problem just di dynamically, looking at it statically uh, right now, looking at it um, kind of temporally over, over time. Uh, I, th I think that's a very a good uh, exercise that we can do uh, to um, uh, give us uh, uh, to, to give us a common ground. Um, I, I, I can sense that it, unless we do that, there's just going to be platitudes on both sides, and I, I, I hear that I hear that from both sides, and I think I think that gives people a positioning, but it doesn't move the process forward. I think to move forward, we have to articulate specific aspects like the importance of development, what that means, and then do that uh, temporally over a long period of time to gain, to, to see what the future should be. What's the ideal? We may not reach it. We may not reach it in time, uh, but what, what would that ideal look like from each uh, uh, individual culture's point of view? Um, we're gonna move on to the closing remark. Deputy Permanent Representative, Mr. Nikita, Zukov. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of uh, 
Ambassador Gatilov, I would like to thank Ambassador Lee Song, all our distinguished panelists, our esteemed moderator, our colleagues from uh, diplomatic missions, academia, and other participants for today's interesting and fruitful discussions. We have listened, uh, we have all listened to different views on how attempts to artificially divide countries on the basis of their conformity with so-called standards and principles formulated and applied by a limited number of stakeholders can lead to a realistic catastrophe in international relations and limit opportunities for dialogue. We have come to the conclusion that all countries should be treated equally. There is no universal democracy. It is evident that in evaluating a state's progress in the fields of democracy and human rights, we should take into account the history of this country, its national, civilizational, and cultural characteristics, moral standards, and traditional values of societies. There is no room for aggressive and compulsory enforcement at the global level of non-agreed and very specific principles and standards inherent to, inherent to only a number of Western societies. No country has the right to dictate their values, nor can anyone punish others for not accepting their approaches. Unilateral coercive measures cannot serve as an uh, instrument of this repressive foreign policy. The practice of dividing states into the good, the good and the bad by creating new dialogue fora of limited participation and based on compliance with selective democratic and human rights standards is completely unacceptable. And I would like to conclude by quoting Nicholas Mistakakis, Patriarch of Constantinople, who in the 10th century wrote in his letter to Al Muqtadir, Caliph of Baghdad, due to the fact that our lifestyle, morals, and object of worship divide us, certainly we should not be hostile and deprive ourselves of communication. I thank you. And finally, I would like to invite His Excellency Ambassador Li Song. Charge the affair of the permanent mission of China to give his concluding remarks. All these discussions, I, I think, just enhance my belief that it is indeed time for us to bring true democracy in the work of uh, the Human Rights Council. Uh, I think what we are doing now, doing here, is, uh, is an effort to uh, true democracy, mutual respect, dialogue and cooperation uh, in the work of Human Rights Council. And I, I think not only for the Human Rights Council, uh, but also for the whole uh, true multilateralism. I think we need this kind of culture, this kind of spirit. And uh, with uh, this uh, webinar, I think it is only a, a starting of a long ongoing process that uh, we are supposed to uh, continue to work on, which will definitely help us to do better in our daily works uh, in Geneva, in either the Human Rights Council and other many other international uh, multilateral efforts. And uh, by concluding, I'd like to thank all the uh, participants, all the support. Uh, I'd like to thank all the efforts made by the staff uh, which uh, make this webinar happen so in, in such a smooth and successful manner. Uh, thank you. Thank everyone. Thank you for coming and see you next time. Thank you. On behalf of the China Mission, Russia Mission, thank you all so very much for being part of the discussion. Um, have a good day, evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Bye for now. <laughs>